Lieutenant of the State Police and the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Protecting Children Roundtable Discussion on Rehoming Adopted Children. I'd like to welcome to my left the Honorable Congress, Congressman James Langevin. To his right, Attorney General Peter Kilmartin. To his right, Dr. Janice DeFrancis, Director of the Rhode Island Department of Children, Youth, and Families. To her right, Ms. Darlene Allen of Adoption Rhode Island. To her right, Ms. Tawuka Lima. Nope. I'm sorry, Ms. Maureen Flatley. <laughs> and then Ms. Tawuka Lima and Ms. Leah Faust. And welcome to Rhode Island State Police Headquarters. Although rehoming, rehoming is not a new issue, we hope that having this roundtable discussion will shed more light on the exploitation of those that may be victimized by these adoption scams. We certainly recognize that the majority of people that adopt children do so for the right reasons. We can manage to tighten up the rules, regulations, and laws to save one person from being a victim, and we'll be successful. Today's conversation concerning the complex issue of individuals utilizing the internet to shift guardianship of adopted children, termed rehoming, without proper oversight, will be initiated by the Honorable James Langevin, Congressman for the 2nd District in the state of Rhode Island. Congressman Langevin serves in the House Armed Services Committee, where he is the ranking member on intelligence, emerging threats and capabilities subcommittee, and on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. The Congressman has dedicated many years of public service at the federal and state levels to the citizens of Rhode Island, focusing his efforts on national security, health care, and cyber security. The top priority for Congressman Langevin is protecting our nation's technology, infrastructure against cyber attacks. Through his work, Congressman Langevin co-founded the Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus to increase awareness around the issues of our nation's cyber threats and co-chaired the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Commission on Cybersecurity for the 44th Presidency, which made policy recommendations to President Barack Obama. As an advocate of, un of universal health care, Congressman Landervin proposed the American Health Benefits Program, which would offer affordable health care to all, and work hard to help pass the Affordable Care Act in 2010. Another priority for Congressman Landervin and the focus of today's discussion is combating the practice of rehoming and to provide law enforcement with the resources necessary to protect our greatest resource, our children. In, 2000, in October 2013, Congressman Langevin introduced House Bill 3423, the Protecting Adopted Children Act. This bipartisan legislation provides for pre and post adoptive counseling to ease the transition for children and families. The bill would fund treatments specialized for adopted children. Adopted parents would have access to peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, support groups, and could access a 24-hour emergency hotline. The bill also calls for a government accountability office study of rehoming practices, including how children are advertised for adoption on the internet. To further delineate on this topic, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce our friend, and our Congressman, James Langevin. Congressman. Colonel O'Donnell, thank you very much, uh, both for hosting us here today, but also for your many, many years uh, committed to, uh, to law enforcement and to the people of the state of Rhode Island. It's, it's wonderful to be with you uh, here as well. Um, and thank you all for coming and uh, giving your time and attention to uh, this very important issue of, of rehoming. Um, I first came to uh, this issue um, within the last year when I became aware of uh, the issue and as a result of a, a Reuters report, and I'll get into more detail in just a, a minute. But for years, um, I had been a, a strong supporter of foster care and adoption issues as a result of my uh, parents who took in a number of foster children over the years that, uh, that I was growing up. And it uh, surely sensitized my, myself to uh, the challenges of foster care and adoption related issues and it certainly informed my work as a policy maker over the years. Um, it was only until recently that I even became aware of the issue of, of rehoming 
and, uh, and the, the, the problems that are associated with it. And, uh, and I've determined, to, along with many of my colleagues, to work to, uh, to end it, uh, or to at least make sure that, uh, uh, that uh, when an adoption doesn't work out, uh, that there, there's uh, a proper way uh, of hopefully remedying the situation, ultimately providing the right resources so that the adoption is successful. Uh, we're here with a great panel of, uh, uh, of experts that I'm going to turn it over to in just, uh, in just a minute. Uh, to my right, I'm beginning with, uh, again, uh, our, uh, Attorney General Peter Kilmartin. I'm uh, grateful uh, for his presence here today. Uh, Peter and I served in the General Assembly together for, for many years and, and have worked together in a number of different capacities, but I've always committed, I've uh, been impressed by his commitment to law enforcement and to the people of our state. So thank you, Peter. Uh, as uh, Colonel mentioned, also Dr. DeFrancis from DCOAF is here, and I thank uh, the Director for uh, your great work in, in protecting the children of our state. Darlene Allen from Adoption of Rhode Island. Uh, we are uh, uh, old partners and friends together in this, uh, and I'm proud to be as a member of the Board of Directors of Adoption of Rhode Island. And uh, Maureen, thank you for making the trip up here, the work that you do at the national level uh, as, uh, as a recognized expert in, uh, in uh, adoption reform. And, uh, and a special thanks to, uh, to Riqua and uh, also uh, to uh, Leah, uh, who are here today. We want to thank you both for uh, being willing to share uh, your stories. And uh, uh, you're, you're going to have a, a great deal to say today, I know. And, and uh, it's important you have an important contribution to make with us. But let me just begin by saying that, uh, like many of you, I first learned of uh, rehoming through uh, the investigative uh, reporting work done by uh, Megan Tuohy's series, uh, The Child Exchange. And in this case, families involved in this unregulated and uh, underground practice are connecting uh, online uh, through uh, internet groups making dubious or in many cases outright illegal arrangement, arrangements to give away their children to strangers, uh, often across state lines with little or, or no legal documentation. Uh, and in some cases with forged or fake documents. Uh, in some cases this has led to child sex trafficking and uh, other uh, horrible situations. Uh, rehoming is dangerous, uh, it's underground and uh, unregulated practice uh, that needs to be brought into the light of day. And that's what this effort uh, here today is all about. Uh, in order to combat this and provide child welfare, welfare agencies, uh, with the resources that they need to prevent rehoming from occurring. Uh, I've introduced, uh, in a bipartisan uh, basis, the uh, Protecting Adopted Children Act last October. Uh, this bill would provide pre- and post-adoptive support uh, services to, to families so that they're able to provide the loving and stable uh, environment that every child deserves. I've also introduced uh, and commissioned a GAO study uh, of rehoming practices that will include recommendations to Congress on actions that we can take uh, to end rehoming. So it's going to be building on the investigative work uh, of the, the Reuters uh, report, uh, but done with government experts uh, who are going to do a deep dive on this issue and help us to really get our arms uh, around understanding the practice and how to end it. Uh, just this, uh, this week, I introduced a bill also to expand uh, the training of uh, Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force to include offers uh, uh, to rehome children. So this will be uh, an expanded area that the, the uh, Internet Crimes Against Children uh, Task Force will look at and be trained in. And, uh, and uh, let me just say that uh, I'm going to now, uh, I'm going to really leave it to the, the panel of experts to expand uh, on these uh, ideas more today. Uh, they are the real experts, and I'm looking forward to hearing how because law enforcement can work alongside uh, state child welfare agencies to ensure that every uh, child has a stable and loving home. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Maureen to introduce uh, these uh, two extraordinary young women uh, who were gracious enough and courageous enough to join us today uh, to share their personal experiences with rehoming. Uh, Maureen Flatley has uh, dedicated her career to advocating for children uh, and in recent years has been one of the loudest voices uh, in the fight against rehoming. And we are so fortunate to have her with us today, and uh, I know that she'll continue to be a leader uh, on this issue. So with that, so Maureen. 
Thank you. I, I have to begin by saying that the work that the Congressman has done on this issue is extraordinary. He literally has taken the lead on an issue that very few people paid attention to or even began to try and understand. It's a very complex issue. And before I introduce the girls, perhaps I can give you a quick overview of the rehoming problem as I have seen it over the years. Um, you know, rehoming is, is kind of a benign name for a practice that we should be rejecting in every possible sense of the word as it is, as it is currently practiced in this country. Um, I've spent the last almost 40 years doing government reform and oversight work and investigating abuses and looking at public policy responses to them. And about 20 years ago, I became involved almost exclusively in child welfare and adoption, which is where I've spent my career since that time. And Rehoming's not new. It's been around for a long time. And initially, because of the changing nature of adoption, it was relatively limited. When you think about adoption on a continuum, in this country, primarily healthy infants for many, many years until the late 60s when we began to see orphans from Korea who were generally fairly well cared for and in pretty decent shape. Over time, Central and South America opened up, Vietnam, those kids were in less good shape. We began to see trauma. But the real explosion of rehoming, as we've seen it, involves a couple of different sectors of kids. Certainly, it has been a problem in foster care, to some extent, with badly traumatized kids. But as we've seen the opening of Eastern Europe, and certainly Ethiopia, uh, and other parts of Africa, it, it's become a perfect storm. You have countries that have very poorly organized infrastructure, if any infrastructure at all. You have an adoption industry that is almost completely absent any meaningful regulation until the last few years. And thank God for John Kerry as the Secretary of State because he is a titan on this issue. He was when he was in the Senate, and he is now. Um, but as we've seen more untrained people who are not experts in social services, who really don't understand the underlying issues for children, get into the cases like Tariq Woods and Leah's. And I have to say that in the last 10 years, these cases have just exploded. And from my perspective, there's sort of three sectors of rehoming. The first is, God willing, what most of them are, which is really good, earnest families who've adopted children, who have no understanding of the trauma and loss that they've experienced, who perhaps had special needs that go well beyond sort of the normal superficial problems you might see in an adoption placement. And they're trying desperately to keep their kids. They're looking for every possible resource they can find to do the right thing. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't, but they're really working hard to protect their kids. You have kind of a second basket of families. And I would say that Tariq, go ahead and correct me if I'm wrong, this is sort of where Tariq's case comes in and to some extent Leah's, where you have families that were well-intended that wanted to adopt certain kinds of children. And then when they found out that the kids that they adopted were not what they thought they would be, they rejected them. So I think Tariq Wood is sort of a perfect example of this kind of rehoming problem. Um, and she'll tell you more about her story, but now we're getting into the introduction part. Um, <coughs> Tariq was adopted, the initial adopted parents were a young military couple. They wanted very much to adopt, and they wanted to adopt young children. They adopted uh, Tariqua and her two younger sisters, a sibling group of three, believing that Tariqua was quite a bit younger than she actually was. They believed that you were about nine, right? When in fact she was 13. Why that fact was not known to the adoption agency <coughs> is mystifying because it was readily documented when the time came. In any case, as Tariqua learned to speak English, and started explaining to the family that she didn't know she was being adopted, she didn't want to be adopted, she had a parent in Ethiopia who could parent her. A tremendous amount of fraud involved in this case. The family, because it was very troubling to them and because Tariqua was quite frankly angry, decided that they would rehome Tariqua but keep her younger sisters. And thus begins Tariqua's story into rehoming. She can, she can give you the details, but in fact, in a very real sense, she was simply returned. And returned in a way that did not comport with her best interests, certainly didn't comport with her long-term safety and well-being. And thank God that this child has been an advocate for herself, and she's not a child anymore. But that's a, that's a profile that we see all the time. And 
I certainly have seen it uh, very frequently involving Eastern European and Russian and Romanian children. And certainly the Ethiopian kids are beginning to surface because there was sort of a shift in sending countries away from Eastern Europe as they shut down because of these abuses to the African countries that were less sophisticated, less well organized, and even but even they are now pushing back. So I think one of the things that you need to think about with rehoming is that when foreign governments like Ethiopia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Russia start to tell you that they're not going to do adoption business with you anymore, you need to step it up when it comes to protecting the kids. The last group of rehoming cases involves kids that are very literally adopted by predators on purpose and are who are poorly screened and who have no supervision pre or post placement. And it all turns into a perfect storm for the kids. Whether there's a well-intended family, a sort of a superficially involved family, or a really deliberately bad family, when these kids begin to enter the rehoming system, it is the gloves are off. No one has any idea where they're going. The federal government has not really been able to wrap their arms around it. And thank God for the congressman, because he has really put a stake in the ground to start to solve this problem. I love the panel that's been put together today, because quite frankly, you're sitting there going, well, how do we solve this problem? It's so complicated. The front line of defense is all in this room. You've got a state attorney general who knows how to enforce the existing laws that can begin to stop this process of sending kids across state lines. You have a state child welfare director who really understands the problem because, quite frankly, a lot of these kids end up in foster care. I have a case in Massachusetts right now where a family tried to give the kid away. They were ultimately revealed to be abusing her badly. Their parental rights were terminated, and she's now in foster care in Massachusetts. Meanwhile, they're in Maine getting another home study to adopt more kids, by the way. Um, and then we have our wonderful state police, and I, as the daughter of an FBI agent, can't say enough about the role that local law enforcement can play to begin to push the problem up to the federal level while the congressman starts to push it down to the local level. But at the end of the day, we, we simply cannot allow this practice to continue. It's, it is handing children over to networks of, ex, of exploiters, of child traffickers. The sexual exploitation of these kids sometimes is absolutely unbelievable. And at the end of the day, um, what keeps me going in this work is that I've had a lot of kids call me over the years directly. A child ages out of the system, they don't know what to do, they hear about the work and they get in touch. But uh, Tariqa and I met four years ago. Um, Australian television was doing a very powerful documentary about child trafficking and abuses in international adoption. And a few days after the story aired, the producer called me and said, you know that young woman that was in another segment of the show with you would like to talk to you. So a few days later, what were you, like 14? Um, 16. 16. She called me and says, I want to do what you're doing. And I have to say that she's been through three or four placements now. She's finally, thank God, living with a wonderful family, my dear friend Lisa Day in Standish, Maine. Um, but this is a child who fought for herself and is now fighting for other kids because she recognized what was happening to her was happening to a lot more kids. And she did not allow herself to be intimidated by the adults around her. She was never intimidated by the political process. We just had a meeting with the governor of Maine a couple of weeks ago. She was like, she was like Ted Kennedy sitting in the room. It was unbelievable. <laughs> um, but I'm here to tell you that these children need our help. And everyone in the room can contribute something to the solution, especially with the incredible congressional leadership that we have here. But at the end of the day, Tariq was the real expert, and Leah's the real expert. Their stories are a little bit different, but I like to think Tariq was kind of like a, running an underground railroad now. She has other rehomed kids getting in touch with her, and she's helping them. And that's something that we should all be doing. So I really think that to listen to Tariq is to really learn about what needs to happen in this situation. And so there you go. There's your introduction. It's kind of long. <laughs> but, no, sincere. <laughs> um, so she pretty much summed up my story. <laughs> um, so I was 13 when I was adopted from um, Ethiopia, and um, it was I didn't know I was gonna get adopted, and my father didn't know I was gonna get adopted. They told us that. Um, the recruiters, child recruiters in Ethiopia told us that we were going to go to America to get education. 
in, in, in edu educational program. So we're gonna come back and visit our family in every summer and stuff like that. And um, once I got to America, I find out that I was adopted and I have a new family. <laughs> and um, I was pretty upset. I mean, I was like, that's not what I signed up for. I have a family in Ethiopia who are healthy, loving, and um, wonderful family in Ethiopia. And I was like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be your kid. <laughs> Send me back to Ethiopia. And um, that's when things started getting rough. Um, and um, eight months later, uh, uh, my adopted mom decided to um, send me to another state from where we were living. Um, it was New Mexico. And um, she sent us to, she sent me on the plane to visit my adopted grandmother, whom I have met twice. And I wouldn't pick her up out in the crowd of people. So I had no idea who she is and things like that. And they sent me off on the plane to visit her. And after I got there, in like maybe 10 days or something, I said that um, I wanted to go back to see my siblings and stuff like that. And they basically said they don't want me back. So. This is another piece of the story, the separation from siblings that happens far too frequently. And it's been three years, really, and you haven't seen your sisters at all. Yep. So, I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I just I lived in Iowa for maybe five years, and I was a junior in high school, and I got kicked out of the adoptive home there. The second one. The second one. Yep. And then um, I just lived with a friend of mine, and um, I decided to rehome myself to Maine the family that I met through advocacy work and stuff like that. And my adoptive parents, both of them, the first and second, reacted very strongly. Um, they said a bunch of damaging stuff about my character, my history, and stuff like that, just to, just going out of their way to stop me from having another family. So, yeah. There was a lot of emotional abuse and you know, here's a child who's being saved from her life in Ethiopia, whatever that meant. She had a middle class life. She had a father who was a professional. She had a big extended family. And incidentally, she's going back to Ethiopia for the first time next week to see her family for the first time since this happened. So her case is riddled with fraud. The adoption agency involved is now bankrupt, right? You're out of business. Um, why they haven't been prosecuted is mystifying to me, South Carolina. Um, so there are all these factors that kind of come together. And in, in Tariqa's case, because she was older, because she was angry, one of the questions that you have to ask is, look, when you're looking at children who are 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, who live with their families a long time, these kids, both of them, explode one of the big myths about rehoming, or at least one of the sort of cliches that, well, kids get rehomed because there's something wrong with the kids. You know, they've been in an orphanage for a long time. They're, brain damage, there's something wrong with them. Well, both of these young women, as you can plainly see, are beautiful, they're articulate. Both of them have continued their educations more or less on schedule with great grades throughout the process. Street was just finished her freshman year in college. She's moved like five times in the last three or four years. Same thing with Leah. Um, this is this issue kind of more broadly. Leah's case is a little bit different. Leah was adopted by a very large family in Southern Virginia, and then just south of DC. You want to talk about your case a little bit? Sure. Thank you guys for the insight. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. Um, I was adopted from Ethiopia about five years ago, I think, if not mistaken. Uh, but I was adopted into a very large family, and I was the oldest of the family. So at the moment, I felt like a lot of responsibility of taking care of the kids and stuff like that was on me. Um, but uh, my, my situation is a little different from Tarifa's. I ended up eventually moving myself when I was of age. But the thing about rehoming is it's completely psychologically damaging for the kids. It's the people whom you trust and the people who you consider your family are the ones that are putting you away. And it's 
start even in the beginning and if, throughout your life that's gonna affect you somehow the people whom you trust to love just don't want you and it's it's completely a transaction um the people involved are in the rehoming process are um people who avoided um like um in, in, in inspections and things like that that are required for the adoption process. So this means they're either somehow legally are people that have having problems legally or just things like that um, we have to consider. And um, so yeah, the children are really, it's really a psychologically damaging process for the children. I think one thing about both of their cases, and this has been very prevalent in the cases that I've handled, is that the families that adopted them originally and then the families that took them on subsequently until now anyway um, tended to be sort of what I would call <laughs> off the grid so their kids were homeschooled there was not the kind of what one hopes to see is sort of the incidental community surveillance so whether they're in the original family or the sort of secondary family because there is I hesitate to use the word cult but there is sort of a this underground group of families that take rehomed kids, the kids aren't going to school where people can see them and, and ascertain their health. They're not getting health care. Their educations are suffering. One of the concerns that Tariqua has is about her sisters who have been homeschooled pretty consistently, who although they're graduating in a program are perhaps still functionally illiterate and now in their mid to late teenage years. So there's an element of neglect in this that robs the kids of the kind of sort of normal routine community surveillance that our kids might have, going to school, going to the pediatrician, um, you know, perhaps going to church or playing on sports teams. These kids are very isolated. When they're handed off, they're even more isolated. And certainly the lawyer's piece um, highlighted the retaliation that these kids experience. Tariqua has been subjected to vicious personal attacks by the original family and the second family that had her. And, you know, one might say, look, they got kind of caught up in all of this themselves. They were victimized themselves in a way. I know you don't want to hear that, but it's true. But nevertheless, and be that as it may, there was zero justification to vilify the child who very innocently became embroiled in this. So I think one of the things in a moving forward sense that we have to do is, to the congressman's point, we have to bring all of this out into the daylight. This, this practice as it is currently handled has got to stop. It ha we, we give really pets who are rehomed far more consideration, and I'm not exaggerating, than we do these kids. And I think Liam raises finally the last, the real irony of this. Let's say there were 8,000 adoptions internationally last year, which is roughly the number, down from 25,000 five or six years ago, because in part, foreign governments are looking at us like we're out of our minds that we're not dealing with this problem. We probably had more than 100 kids, internationally adopted kids, murdered by adopted parents as a result of severe child abuse. So again, if a, if a single plane crashes, the federal government stops the music. Everything is grounded. They look at it. They investigate it. GM has a couple of cars that blow up and kill people. Boom. They're sitting at, in a congressional hearing about it getting grilled. The adoption industry has no such scrutiny because everybody believes that they're sort of, well, it's a good thing. You know, Adoption is a great thing. Adoption can be a phenomenal thing, especially if you do it the way Darlene does it. Um, but for these children who were saved, the trauma that they've experienced as a result of their sort of misguided adoptions is far worse than anything that they've encountered in their home countries. And I would argue that both of these kids actually had a sort of a step down in terms of their standard of living. Maureen, thank you, and Tariqa and Leah, wow, uh, that was incredibly powerful, so I knew it would be. Thank you for your courage and, and for being willing to share your stories. It, um, it, it, it helps to convey the, the challenge that we're facing, the problem of rehoming it, and uh, it should re-energize all of us to, to want to end it. So thank you for that. And uh, with that, before we go into some questions, I want to now just turn it over. Uh, just give the, our Attorney General and our Director of PCOF and also Darlene the opportunity to make some uh, some opening comments as well, and then uh, we'll start the, uh, for the panel discussion. 
Thank you, Congressman, and sincerely thank you for convening this and including me as part of this panel. And I especially want to thank uh, Tariqa and Leah for coming and putting a real human face to this. Um, you know, it's one thing for all of us in our respective roles to talk about it and try to educate about it, um, but putting a real human being in front of people with the courage to come forward um, is priceless. And so thank you for doing that, especially on behalf of all the kids that you're trying to look out for by doing that. And that's, <clears throat> and that's what part of this is about. Um, I, when I first learned of this, that people could do this through adoptions and rehoming, number, first, my first thought, candidly, was, was my own mom, who was adopted when she was about five years old, back in the day when you didn't even talk about adoptions back in the 30s, or actually the 20s. So that was my first. And then the other thought I had was the celebration we do every year in family court when we do adoptions. And, and there was something Maureen just mentioned about it. It should be a happy moment. And I've heard, I can't tell how many judges say, it's really a, a one good day in family court because they see so many other bad things that happen in that courtroom. But looking at it from my perspective as the Attorney General, I also look at this as a very distinct form of human trafficking. A very distinct form, and one that has not had much light shown upon it. One that clearly needs much more um, exposure, education, and when I say education, I'm, I don't mean just to the general public, but I mean amongst prosecutors. I mean amongst law enforcement uh, to recognize it. I mean amongst the professionals here who are dedicated to children. Um, and I mean it for myself. The education portion to this is what is, becomes viable, viable or vital at this stage to make the solving of the problem more viable. Because one, we need to take an honest to goodness recognition that it exists. And that's what you two young ladies just did. The second part though is how do we deal with it? How do I as a prosecutor deal with it? And one of the ways that we need to deal with it is through, as I mentioned, the education and law enforcement. U.S. Attorney Narona and I have done seminars on human trafficking, recognition of it, how to find it, how to notice it, even in the neighborhood. How does local law enforcement find it when they're working? And the control uh, that I'm sure was put over you young ladies and that is put over on people in these situations there is emotional abuse, but there is emotional, emotional control to create the fear, to deny, in, in your case, your history, where you came from, that you, oh, no, you're here for an adoption. No, you're here, and you were a bad kid, so we had to find another home. Those are the things, those are the, the, the points that need to be caught and recognized by all of us in, in our respective professions. But the other part to it that we really need is an update of um, how we look at adoption agencies. Now we have the best right here, and Rhode Island has several great adoption agencies. But we now, in my mind, need to do a better job of having everyone register as an adoption agency so we know who is doing it identify those who are refusing to register because that will send up a red flag that maybe they are working in this rehoming industry and provide some of those other safeguards in the initial phases. The other part though is we need to strengthen the toolbox. We need to give prosecutors more specific statutes to this specific topic. 
And what I, what I like about the federal initiative is if we can get a multi-state, 50-state approach to this where we have the compact, then we are all dealing with the same ground rules. Because if this crosses state lines, it will be much easier for either local prosecution to do, either in a DA's office, or in my case, the Attorney General's office, or at the federal level. But until we make that recognition, and from what I've read, not all states are there. In fact, it's becoming the new initiative to one, as we mentioned earlier, get the education out there. So we, those are the part of the answers that we need to work on and solve. And, and again, I commend the congressman for bringing it to light because if we don't have the recognition, if we don't have the proper investigation, and they do great investigations through ICAC and other means, and then the right prosecution, we need all legs on the table, underneath the table, supporting the table. From the social service end into the areas I just mentioned. The, the other part to it, in, in my opinion, is um, we really need, we really need to find a way to go after these websites that allow this to be posted. They hide under the Communication Decency Act, Section 203, I believe it is. They hide behind that act and say, it would stop the internet from providing the service it does. It's free speech. That's baloney. That's baloney. We should not be allowing any website, back page or any other, to engage in human trafficking and say, no, that comes under freedom of speech. How many times have the court said, we all have our freedom of speech, but we can't yell in a crowded movie theater fire when there is no fire? But right now, one of the fires that does exist is human trafficking and rehoming. So that's a, a real troubling aspect. And it's not just troubling to me, it's troubling to my colleagues from across this country because I can't tell you how many times we have had this discussion, we have had written letters, and we are trying to get people to act on that very aspect of this issue. And the internet today only helps facilitate this problem. It doesn't help solve it, it's helping facilitate it. And I think these are the areas that we collectively need to work together. And that is our best chance to hopefully solving the problem because there is no way any one of us up here as an individual agency or person can solve this problem without the cooperation and help of the other agency um, that is here and other agencies that aren't sitting at this table. Some of the best success we've had is when the colonel and myself and the U.S. attorney or any other group work together to help solve an investigation, to see where it's going to go, and find the best prosecution, and working with local agencies when appropriate, the, the non-governmental organizations or the governmental organizations. But that, without that cooperative effort, we're fortunate in a small state Rhode Island, like Rhode Island because the phone, the colonel can pick up the phone anytime and call me. I can do it with him. I can do it with any chief of police in the state. I can do it with DCYF. I can do it with my congressman. Well, actually, you're not my congressman. I live in the other district. <laughs> um, but I still can do it with the congressman. We have an advantage that many states don't have, that that cooperative uh, effort can happen, and we need to do more of it. So that's um, some of the comments I just wanted to make. Thank you, Attorney General Kilmartin. I appreciate your perspective. And with that, let me turn it over to Director of Defense for her comments. Um, thank you for this opportunity, um, Congressman Blanchard, for again bringing this to the forefront and making um, this an issue that we need to pay attention to. To Tawika and Leah, my goodness, your courage and your resiliency. But 
more importantly, your advocacy is what that we need to hear. And again, I agree. Putting, um, unfortunately, putting a face to the the law, to the act, um, is one that makes it more human for us. But I, I believe, in listening to your story and listening to the non-regulation on the on this process, that it's criminal. It's not just. Uh, it's also abuse and neglect. And so, I, uh, to me, that in the forefront of that, we need to do something. Um, that urgency is now. Again, um, the, the laws that are uh, being proposed are, are also very important because they're not just about intervention and regulation, but also prevention. The opportunity for, and, and Maureen, the three sort of like um, categories that you outlined are very profound because we, we deal with those kind of categories on a daily basis in, in, in child welfare. Um, I, before I came here today, um, I was talking to someone that were coming up for this press conference on rehoming, and they asked me to describe what it was. I didn't do the kind of job that you both did in terms of explaining it. But they were actually, um, couldn't believe that this was a practice that was allowed in our country and that was happening. Um, and it's interesting to hear how that has an impact on how we are not allowing for more opportunities for adoptions in terms of different countries. People look at it very differently. They give different excuses for it. Um, the, when you talked about the three areas, a group that, of, of individuals who really want to adopt, that want to bring children to their homes and, and give them a loving home. And again, we do see that on that one day at Family Court where we see that celebration. But even in Rhode Island, we have at times disruptions in adoption, I'm sure Darlene will speak about, where if we had the intervention, the pre-counseling, the counseling, the respite, the intervention during the time, um, perhaps we could be much more um, preventive in helping these families and these, and these children and youth. The, the second one, in terms of not getting the type of information, that, it seems like, that in itself is criminal that the kind of information about where you were going, how you were going, as well as the family that was receiving you, both of you, that should have been something that was regulate, regulated, had a process that had someone monitoring it in the oversight. And then the third one, which is even more um, disheartening or just um, appalling, is the, is the category of individuals who seek that internet process, so who are predators who engaged these children and youth in human trafficking. And unless we start to do that kind of regulation um, and, and enforce this, um, we are not going to be able to touch that area until this happens. And again, it's not about freedom of speech. Again, that's criminal acts that need to be stopped. So um, our opportunity in the state of Rhode Island to work cooperatively bringing this to an issue to the forefront that we need to stop this immediately, I think is critical. And I believe we can do that. And I uh, applaud the, the pa and hope that these laws get passed. Um, because again, they are both the, the answer to the intervention, but more so even the prevention. So thank you for that. But thank you for your courage. Director DeFrancis, thank you very much for your comments. And we now turn it over to Valerie Allen from the Doctrine of well, thank you, Congressman, and also Attorney General Martin and Director DeFrancis, and both of you and Maureen. I really appreciate being here. I, um, I'm the Executive Director of Adoption Rhode Island, and we're a nonprofit agency dedicated here in Rhode Island uh, to find families for children in the foster care system and to provide a range of support services to those children and families impacted by foster care and adoption. And right now, we're celebrating 30 years of adoption excellence because we believe that all children deserve a family and that children and families created through adoption deserve support prior to, during, and after adoption. Adoption is a lifelong process, and there are unique experiences and challenges that individuals and families and members of the adoption community sometimes experience. We serve as the state's adoption exchange, which means by statute, all children in need of an adoptive family resource are referred for recruitment services, and all families approved for adoption are referred for matching. We provide pre and post adoption <coughs> services, advocate for public policy to promote a child's right to a safe environment and a permanent family, and increase public awareness of the unmet needs of these children. No child should go through the agony of rehoming. 
My interest in this phenomenon stems from my concerns related to both adoption disruptions and the increase of child trafficking in foster care population. Although no money is exchanged between the adoptive parents, the discovery of an underground network to obtain children outside of any regulation or oversight certainly is extremely concerning and very, very unsafe. Rehoming is an issue that we need to gain a better understanding and address it comprehensively to ensure child safety. To provide a bit of context in adoption, and Maureen has done a little bit of this already, but um, the number of adopted children in the U.S. rose from 1.1 million in 1991 to 1.4 million in 2009. The perception of adoption in this country is generally very positive. According to the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, about 4 in 10 Americans have considered adopting a child at one time in their lives, which equates to about 81.5 million adults. And 90% of adoptive parents in any type of adoption are satisfied with their adoption experience. There have been dramatic changes in the number of children adopted internationally in this country. In 2004, there were over 22,000 children adopted into this country, and by 2012, that number fell to 8,668. In the mid-1970s, there were approximately 49,000 infants placed in the, in the U.S. for adoption. By 2007, the most recent year for which accurate numbers exist, there were approximately 18,078 U.S. infants placed for adoption. The world that I spend most of my effort is public child welfare adoption. Over the past five years, nationally, there has been a steady decline in the number of children in foster care. In 2008, there were 463,792 in foster care, compared to 397,122 in 2012. And although there's been a decrease in the number of children waiting to be adopted, the number of children adopted from foster care has remained fairly consistent over the past five years, with numbers in the low to mid 50,000s each year. Unfortunately, at the same time, we've seen an increase of youth aging out of foster care, with more than 25,000 children exiting foster care without a permanent family. And we are working diligently to decrease those numbers and increase the percentage of children exiting foster care to a permanent family. Here in Rhode Island, as of December 31, 2013, there were 2,010 children under the age of 21 in the care of DCYF who were in out-of-home placements, which means foster care, group homes, and residential facilities. And after years of decline, this total represents a slight increase from 1,947 in 2012. On December 13, 2013, there were 2,520 children living in DCYF-related adoption. There are 500 more children connected to DCYF through adoption than children in the foster care system. So we're seeing that increase. And although adoption is widely accepted and perceived as positive, there are growing challenges in adoption. Despite its success, adoption practice has grown more complicated over the years, with more and more children entering their families at older ages, following a history of neglect, abuse, institutionalization, or other forms of trauma. These life experiences, coupled with the normative stressors associated with being adopted, have resulted in significant parenting challenges for adoptive families, often uh, leading them to seek services of mental health professionals. Um, a number of studies have found that emotional and behavioral problems in children adopted from foster care are not uncommon, and in one study, adoptive families reported that one-third of their children had emotional problems and 40% had behavioral problems. Currently, issues such as the rate of adoption disruptions, disillusions, and most recently, the rehoming phenomenon are really challenging the field to identify practices, policies, and interventions that have better outcomes for the population. Although rates are not consistently reported, the research around disruptions um, falls between 10 and 25 percent of adoption placements are disrupting. At Adoption Rhode Island, at any given time, we are recruiting adoptive families for a high percentage of children who have experienced at least one adoption disruption, and many of them have had two or more. Luckily, we have a DCYF-funded family preservation program dedicated to assisting families to prevent unnecessary adoption disruption. But this is very traumatic to all involved. In adoption, we hope there would be no disruptions or disillusions. But if there is, it needs to be ethical, legal, safe, and involve child welfare. 
Over the past year, Adoption Rhode Island, in partnership with DCYF and Rhode Island Family Court, have been concerned about our adoption rush disruptions in Rhode Island and have been working together to look at the challenges and contributory factors so we can begin to address them. The issues that arise in rehoming span child protection, internet safety, interstate regulations and laws, adoption policies, practices and ethics, as well as services and supports for children and families. One of the most significant issues that Adoption Rhode Island has been advocating for is what we call adoption competent and trauma informed mental health and child welfare services. One of the most frequent complaints from members of the extended family of adoption is their inability to find mental health care and other services from professionals who are considered adoption competent. Many families, and I'll particularly talk about the first bucket of families, um, seek help again and again without significant improvement. An early study in Massachusetts found that some families sought help up to 10 different practitioners before they found someone that was actually able to help them. And a recent study of adoptive families seeking mental health treatment for their children found over 80% had received treatment from another practitioner in the past. Failure to find genuine help can lead families to receive no help, grow desperate, and grasp at alternative treatments. The rehoming concern must be further examined to identify and address issues that create the safety risks such as adoption screening, assessment and training of adoptive families, ethical practices of adoption agencies and adoption facilitators, fraud and corruption in adoption, and the oversight necessary to ensure all children born in this country or entering this country through adoption are safe and free of abuse and neglect. However, we do not need additional research, research to know that there's a dearth of mental health resources that are knowledgeable about adoption and trained in trauma-informed treatments. We do need to increase those services and research post-adoption supports with rigor and ensure evidence-based interventions are available for this population. Unless we address this locally and nationally, we'll continue to see children disrupting from their adoptive families, children remaining in foster care without adoptive family placements, and youth, out of, youth aging out of foster care with no permanent family support system, and unfortunately an underground, unregulated network that assists in the transfer of custody of children. Rhode Island recently received a federal grant titled Adopt Well Being Rhode Island to help create a system that is more adoption competent and trauma informed and an advisory group has just been established and the work is just beginning. Adoption Rhode Island, DCYF and Rhode Island College also partnered together to help train professionals on adoption through the Clinical Issues and Adoption and Foster Care Certification <laughs> Program. This has been a very successful professional development program for clinicians, adoption and foster care social workers and others. To wrap up, the practice of rehoming that was brought to light through Reuters and NBC News last September deserves further congressional and law enforcement investigation so we can determine what the practices, policies, and laws are that contribute to this unsafe and unacceptable practice and what is needed to prevent it. No state or federal laws prohibited it until recently when Wisconsin was the first state to enact legislation prohibiting rehoming. We also need to shed light on the need for specialized mental health and supportive services for children, youth, and families that are brought together for, through adoption so that they can come together and stay together. We need to address the trauma that many of the children and youth have experienced as well as provide the unique supports that the growing number of children, youth, and families impacted by adoption need, want, and have been crying out for for years. When children cannot safely remain with their family of origin, adoption must be a safe, ethical, and necessary method of creating family. Because of adoption, children and families' lives can be changed for generations, and every child deserves a family. As I mentioned earlier, there are more children in adoptive family homes than in foster care in Rhode Island, so we need to better address their growing and unique needs to ensure safety, permanency, and well-being of all of our children. Thank you very much for inviting me here and providing me this opportunity to speak passionately about these kids and families I care so deeply. Thank you, Dolly, and uh, for all the work you're doing at Adoption Rhode Island and the years of dedication to the children in our state and the local foster care and adoption related issues. Thank you. And to all our panelists, again, thank you. Um, so I'd like to start with a couple of questions, as if I could start with uh, Jerry Quad and, uh, and Leah. I, um, I thought, uh, you know, as I'm listening to you and, and hearing your stories, what do you think that uh, would have uh, been most helpful to you when when you were rehomed. You know, what um, what can we do as you know as initial steps 
obviously we want to stop this practice, but what do you think, there are things that come to the mind that, that you would identify as saying, you know, this would have made a difference? Um, I would add to that, there has to be a system where adopted kids, um, especially international adopted kids, could connect to their previous agencies or um, people involved in the system, let's say advocates and things like that, or let's say a numbers that they could call to, because a lot of these things are documented. So I would say like having a system that um, helps children connect to their agencies or somewhat advocates and things like that would. I think Tariq was said something interesting to me when we first connected. <laughs> which was that you know there, she understood sort of viscerally that there was a mandated reporting system and she understood that there was a domestic violence hotline and she said you know kids need a hotline we need a hotline they, she just happened to stumble onto somebody who could be a hotline for her yeah. but I think that was the number one thing on her list and I would say um, the, with the process of adoption especially international ado adoptees we have um, a social worker and things like that that put the kids in the place where the adoptive home, the person that did home studies and stuff like that. Those people should be able to speak our native languages for international adoptees. So then we can address the concerns and the abuse or what's going on inside the home. So it's faster to say like the um, social worker comes into your house and say, hey, I didn't know I was adopted, so no, I'm adopted. What do I do, you know? But with my social worker, she only spoke English, and I didn't speak any English. So who do I talk to? Who do I tell what's going on? And my con concerns or my emotions and things like that. And um, definitely what Leah said, we need a hotline for adoptees to call. We need, um, we need to, they need to keep database of adoptees who are rehomed. So we know how many adoptees have been rehomed especially with the adoption agencies that are going out of business or they're going out um, they are um, going bankrupt but they don't know how many children have been rehomed how many children are in the same home they were adopted to so we need the country of origin the um, like because I was adopted from Ethiopia the Ethiopian government should be updated on how many kids are actually in the home they were adopted to you know on this point one of the things that shocked me when I got into adoption work, coming from other areas of government reform and oversight, was how little data there was and how little knowledge there was. And, uh, in fact, Senator Whitehouse, who is a dear friend and another titan, as far as I'm concerned, and I were talking about this a few years ago, and I said, you know, if Walmart can keep track of every single pair of shoes that's manufactured in a factory in China until it goes on my grandchildren's feet, we can keep track of these kids. Every single one. And part of the, the paradox here is that when a social worker gets called back into a case, the first thing the agency thinks about is not child safety, they think about liability. Mm -hmm. And so one of the issues, as far as I'm concerned, is this is, remember the good old days when you could drive drunk and kill people and it was kind of legal, and then Mothers Against Drunk Driving got involved? Well, that's what this field needs. This field needs a wake-up call, like a Mothers Against Drunk Driving. People need to be prosecuted for what's happening to these kids. The other piece of it is the home study. If we don't get a national home study standard that is the highest standard that we can possibly manage, these kids are never going to be safe. Because yep. if you look at her home studies, which I have, that you you see that the family was they were they were decent people, but they didn't have the equipment for what they got involved with. And it was really the adoption agency's piece to figure that out. And yet, in a private adoption, unlike, thank God, the public sector, which does a phenomenal job of screening, in a private adoption, almost no one is turned down for a home study because the agencies have such fear of liability. Thus, anybody, and when I say anybody, I mean anybody can adopt a child, and that is not a good thing. And, and let me ask you this, I mean, those are powerful points, very powerful. What um, what are the, the the most important services that you think families need so that uh, adoptions don't become disruptive or failed adoptions in the, in the first place? 
with my kids, my kids, my my adoption, the whole thing was fraud. Um, I shouldn't have been adopted. I had a loving home, loving family. I had a home in Ethiopia where I went to school. I got education and things like that. But they are in, I understand there's cases where the kid, children need adoptions. In that case, we need post-adoption support. Yeah, I think, to my point earlier, there are nuances in this issue, and there are different kinds of cases. In, in Tariqa's case, which I've investigated pretty exhaustively, this was never going to work, never going to work. And what's really troubling is that she's now not only separated from her biological family in Ethiopia, but she hasn't had any contact with her siblings. And the trauma that that has done to all three of these kids is never going to be unpacked for years. But I think what I see over and over again is, to Darlene's point, and I think Darlene has masterfully laid out the challenge here, the earnest families are just looking for anybody that understands what they've been through. And the kids, the needs really seem to change based on their age. And I think we really have to be thinking very differently about international adoption with older kids because, first of all, here at least we at least acknowledge that older kids can have a say in what happens. But that doesn't really happen with international adoption. And to Tariqa's point, the language barriers have proven over and over again to be a tremendous complicator. You know, whether you've got a Russian kid or a Romanian kid or an Ethiopian kid or a kid that speaks another language. I mean, I'll just, your example of speaking a mark, she would speak a mark to her sisters because that's the only language she knew. Yeah. And the parents began to get paranoid that they were talking about them. Of course, they probably were to some extent, but <laughs> that's what they were doing. And they got angry and they got upset. And so I think the lack of cultural education, yep. um, I think that the language barriers, Tariq was absolutely right, that unless a family understands these kids are going to speak a certain language, they should be allowed to maintain that language. She's learning a mark all over again, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's so, it, the services piece is huge, but a lot of this can really be filtered at the front end with more preparation and screening and filtering and education. I think every state should have the public agency's standards for home studies and screening. And not everybody should be allowed to adopt. This family was not prepared for three kids. They weren't prepared for older kids. And it just wasn't going to work. Just sit for the discussion purposes, can you, can you go into what goes into the, the, the home study and, and the things that would identify the problems? Or well, I'll give you an example from my case file. Um, about nine years ago, some of you may recall, and I think Tom at NBC covered this, or NBC covered it. Um, I had a case involving a young Russian girl who was adopted by a pedophile. And the case was notorious because she was rescued almost incidentally in an FBI child pornography stain. They didn't know that he had a child. They just knew he had a lot of child pornography. But she answered the door when they executed the search warrant. and. Um, and this case is sort of illustrative in two ways. Um, the child was readopted, it turns out, by a horrendously inappropriate second parent, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but in the meantime, her attorney, who and I typically will work with the kids with, through their attorney, um, was looking at all the options for civil justice that she might have. It's extremely difficult to successfully prosecute in civil court a wrongful adoption claim on behalf of the child because there aren't enough rules. So it's really no water break in a way. But when we got a hold of the home study in this particular case, it was almost incredible because this guy was a single 45-year-old divorced man living by himself. He happened to be very wealthy because he was a child pornography kingpin, it turns out. Um, but in the home study, he actually said to the social worker, I have one biological daughter with whom I have a poor relationship, and I'd like to adopt a blonde-haired, blue-eyed five-year-old girl. Now, if the social worker had bothered to drive six blocks to interview his daughter, she would have learned that the reason they had a poor relationship is because he molested her for six years, but she had never told anybody. The daughter, as it turns out, didn't know he was adopting until after the adoption was finalized. In the home study, it also said, um, the gentleman's house, very affluent, wealthy house, no room for a child. Because he never planned for her to have her own room, and no one went back and checked to make sure there was one. And the child slept with him every single night that she was in his custody, five long years. Um, and so you can imagine our horror as we continue to read through this really superficial document. 
He gives three references about what a great guy he is. They are all people who work for him, subordinates in his company, who later said when we interviewed them, well, I couldn't say anything bad about the guy. I mean, I didn't know he was a child pornographer, but I knew he was going to fire me. So that, that was the home study, in a nutshell. There was no follow-up visit, despite the fact that Russia has rules about following up and supervising. They never went back. They falsified the visitation reports, actually. And by the way, the agency involved in this case, where there were three, really, um, very well respected, you know, blue ribbon, accredited by COA, top of the line, as it were. But when they were confronted with what happened, and they were called back in when the child was rescued, what did they do? They rushed her into a second home because they thought, wrongly it turned out, because this was another Tariqua, that no one would ever know. Her second placement, keeping in mind at this point the child is 11 years old, severely traumatized, literally chained in a basement much of the time she was in this guy's care, the FBI drops her off at a local hospital, happened to be in my hometown of Pittsburgh. Two days later, she's placed in the care of a mentally ill, destitute, 25-year-old foster parent, who then proceeded for another two years to brutally um, abuse her emotionally and to some extent physically, withheld food. There were a whole lot of details. The child finally, alleged to her attorney and me at the Angels and Adoption Award in 2006, I'm gonna, um, and she remained in that woman's care for another year until all the various child welfare agencies could really get their arms around what happened was removed. That adoption was annulled, and she's now been adopted by a third family. She's 24 years old. Believe it or not, she's doing kind of okay. But here you have one child, not one, but two bad adoptions, all of them directly related to the home study, and in all of the cases, the adoption agencies involved were highly reputable. I mean, top of the line, you think of the industry, they're all joint council members, etc. So, you know, to my way of thinking, the best way to protect kids, to some extent, is to prevent it from happening in the first place. And this is a system that is completely out of control. And one of the things that I'm hoping we can pursue as a discussion moving forward is the three things that have to happen. One is that home study standards have to be really standardized. And the highest standards apply across the board nationally. Because right now, you've got public agency, private agency, international. The foreign countries have a lot of different requirements. And there's no consistency. And adoption's always been viewed as a state law issue, despite the fact that since dating back to when your mom was adopted, it's always been an interstate proposition. And all inter-country adoption is de facto interstate commerce. So you know, I think about this in the days when I was first starting out in politics when the EPA was created. And, People said, oh, you know, we can't tell the states what to do. And, you know, the federal government getting involved, that couldn't be good. And it's going to be expensive and it's going to drive people out of business. Well, guess what? You know, a lot of good has arisen from that. And in a lot of ways, the companies involved have made more money than ever. The same thing happened with the Clean Air Act and the automotive industry. This is an industry that has evaded regulation for really 150 years. And they've done it by saying, well, if you regulate us, I'll be bad for the kids. But I'm here to tell you, and these kids are here to tell you, if we don't get the federal government involved in regulating this, U.S. Attorney General, state Attorney General's working hand in hand, you pointed out the compact issues, really good idea. Um, so home studies have to be improved. In terms of the rehoming statutes being created in Wisconsin, I think it's a great idea, but I'm concerned that if we don't get the feds to level the playing field, we're going to get havens of, of rehoming. <laughs> which we kind of have now with adoption. You know, we joke that, you know, like Oklahoma is like the Las Vegas of adoption. People travel there because you can do things you can't do in other states. And the final piece is that the existing laws have to be, have to be prosecuted and enforced. And I think, as I said, it's cultural. And we all know that some, sometimes things go in waves. So, you know, gun control is big right now. But this has got to be attacked. And people say, well, if we do it, it's going to be bad for adoption. <laughs> I would say. You know, if you look at the Clean Air Act as an example, automakers have never sold more cars, right? And I think I know from talking to foreign governments that there would be way more interest in adoption if we could just demonstrate that as the biggest, most powerful country in the world, that we have the best standards. And right now, we don't, which is kind of horrible. 
can, can we talk about uh, about follow-up? Because it seems to me that uh, if there was frequent follow-up visits on behalf of child welfare agencies, that a lot of this would be caught early on, and and we could prevent a lot of these things. Can we, you know, talk about this, you know, from from Rhode Island's perspective? How do we do in terms of follow-up? I know that there's significant follow-up with foster care issues when the child's in foster care, but does that carry over to adoptions? And and then we can maybe talk about. Uh, you know, uh, I did take a year after from, uh, again, uh, to blood and uh, to, to, to hear about the, what follow-up there was when they were in the care. So can we maybe start with Dr. DeFrancis? Well, I, I think that's what's very important is all the home visitation and, and doing those kind of visits and site visits and documenting that, but going on different occasions, being able to really monitor, and then also monitor. So it's interesting to listen to standards and some of the agencies that you even spoke of met COA accreditation mm -hmm. but it's it's not just having the standards but also being able to monitor and have a monitor and oversight of those standards. Um, I, I believe also that we're talking about resources that are necessary and, and not just resources but a value and a priority to this population, to these children, to these families in the state of Rhode Island and, and nationally. That they, de they don't demand, they deserve the opportunity to be brought into a family that has the support by, by the state government, by the different agencies within the state um, that provide, a, and a, again, your, the bill talking about peer-to-peer -peer support, which is very powerful in terms of adoption families, um, pre and post, during adoption, after adoption, um, the 24-hour hotline that we know that would be critical um, the language bank of professional interpreters that can go in and assist the child or the youth with that family uh, are critical resources that we should devote money to. And also to the fact that currently the DCYF system staffing is one quarter down. There's their FTEs in support so that our caseworkers can do that work and, and, and you know with other agencies is critical. So the, again, uh, the resource piece is critical. I think we know what we need to do, but we have to have those um, resources available and not available on a six-week waiting list. Because when there's a crisis in a family, they need that support immediately and ongoing. So where we can do that um, would be very important. Well, I would agree um, with Dr. DeFrancis. I also think that, again, um, we really need to look at from both a local and a national level, what are the um, overs oversight, what policies and practices do we have in place now and what do we need to put in place? Um, unless a child is going into foster care, the child welfare department wouldn't even know that any of this is happening. So we have public child welfare departments that are our arm in government to protect children, but there's no link to children that need protection in this process. So. I think we need to look at that. I think the issue, um, and you know, obviously I don't work in private adoption. We do have some people here that are in private adoption. There are requirements for post-placement visits, but if there are organizations that are fabricating, that are saying they're doing it that aren't, that gets down to, again, resources related to oversight and inspections around making sure that, that the licensed agencies that do the adoptions are actually what they say they're supposed to be doing and I don't think we don't have that in place um, in this state and I know we don't have it nationally so there are I think there are points where we can look at from the beginning of the process to the end where we need to link we need to link things and, um, and create better oversight and, and support. I think the whole issue of inspection is kind of a double-edged sword because it, you know there's a although most private agencies are licensed by their states, and I happen to think that Rhode Island and Massachusetts, where I live now, do a really great job. Um, but it's, I would almost analogize it to the way restaurants are inspected, where you have that random spot check by a third party, because there is a little bit of an inherent conflict of interest, and even the best agencies sometimes can lose track of what's going on, and so, again, you know, it feels a little adversarial to people who are doing a good job, I think, but on the other hand, if you're an honest broker, you should have nothing to hide. 
And I think that gets to one of the points you made. One, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of self-reporting because somebody, it, to, no, because to your point though, the, the stellar agencies and these issues happen, and I don't know if that was self-reporting or not, but that's what popped in my head that sometimes there'll be an agency that, well, we don't want to say this because we don't want the black eye, even though they're doing the right thing. Um, so that's a problem, but the, the result, one of the things, and we're trying to do this with, with uh, the elderly right now, and Rhode Island has it regarding children, you know, that if there's suspicion, it should, there should be mandatory reporting mm -hmm. by uh, whatever agency is involved. And, you know, we have it with children, but this might be an area where we even need to maybe codify it a little better with regard to adoption, that if if you know you become aware of something you it's mandatory reporting you know one thing i'm not an attorney but one thing that occurs to me too is that it, just from an analytical point of view if you look at state statutes about abandonment you can't do this to your biological children right and since adoption does create the legal fiction that these kids are <laughs> your biological children you know just if we were to start there because right now what i'm concerned about as a great proponent of adoption is that it's almost like the trend to divorce, you know? It's like, oh, if it doesn't work out, we'll just get divorced. And that is exactly what's happening to these kids. So I think we've really got to help adopted parents understand that when you cross this line, you are in the same, you, you, there's no giving back. Okay? You've got to either figure it out or think about it before you do it. Because if all we did, I think, was create that parity in terms of enforcement, we'd be miles ahead in terms of protecting the kids. Good point. That that goes to the whole post-adoption resources issue to make sure that if the adoptions don't go bad to begin with. Uh, there's the resources there. Um, Tariqa and Leah, can you can you just uh, shed some light on your experience with um, your post-adoption follow-up? Was there any? And if so, you know, if there was any follow-up, how often did it happen? Um, there was a follow-up with. Um, the social worker after we got here and I remember her coming three times in about two years and that's about it. That is that is all that there was as far as hey, what was your interaction with that that counselor? Did you have one on one time with the counselor to I did the not. We sat with the family and um she basically talked to um all of us together, but that's about it. It was not a one-on-one -on -one situation going on. So even if you had concerns, you really couldn't say anything. No, but most kids don't even speak the language, so this the language barrier is a huge, huge deal. Yeah, great so. point. Yep. Um, that I would add to that. Um, with my social worker, she came. Um, I lived with them for um, eight months with my first adoptive parents. And she came once, and I remember her telling us that someone's coming, and the lady just basically watched us in rap to um, our adoptive our adoptive parents' biological kids, and with my siblings and things like that. And she didn't even talk to us. I mean, we didn't have the language to talk to talk to her, but she could have asked, "How are you doing? How are you?" No, nothing. She was talking to our adopted mom the whole time and she never even talked to us and we didn't even know how we would benefit from her. And um, with international adoption, with Ethiopian adoption, um, parents, adoptive parents write every year a report to the adoption agency how their adoption is going. And that pretty much can mean the adoptive parents saying, oh yeah, they're doing great. Or saying, oh, well, I just got rid of one, but you don't need to know about her. She's doing fine, you know? <laughs> so um, pretty much it's just, that's pretty much how easy and how just horrible it is, basically. Um, yeah. You know, as the daughter of an FBI agent who learned a lot about interrogating people and optimal interrogation techniques from my dad, there are really two things that happen over and over with these cases. It, even if the kids are interviewed by themselves, if they say anything critical, mm -hmm. it's like snitching out your gang. You know, it's like you are. Absolutely, in the middle of it. And, you know, I, in one case, uh, the case I referenced a minute ago uh, with the kid uh, was in foster care. The family 
who were fairly well educated and affluent, were trying to figure out how to get rid of this kid. And she was 11 and her biological sister was aged. They had both kids. They only wanted the uncle. So they decided that they were going to hatch a scheme to make an allegation, it false, it turns out, that the child was perpetrating against them and her younger sister. So they called the local police department and made a criminal allegation against her because that's another way to trigger, get her out of here with us not paying for a stay in foster care. But the police who took the call just happened to be brilliant. And they interviewed the kid alone and they got the whole story. And it was amazing because the child was not a fluent English, English speaker at that point, but she spoke Spanish and they had a Spanish speaking cop. And they quickly discerned that in fact this kid was being abused by them. And that's what triggered this day with DCF. So, you know, it's, you don't want to kind of overly, you know, kind of make it an adversarial process necessarily, but children inherently have no power. And the main reason these two women are sitting right here is that they're over 18 and they can speak for themselves now, which by the way is how most of these cases really get flushed out. And so, again, what do we do? You know, is it a, is it a critical social work function? You know, how do we read the tea leaves, as it were? You know, how do we know they're okay? You know, if they're not like wearing a cast or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's a very powerful point, too, that it, um, that if there if there's not a, a mechanism but well thought out for the child to to be candid about the situation and then how to handle the follow-up uh, yeah it it, it there could be tremendous pressure and consequences I would imagine put on the, the child if they were to reveal what the what the truth is what the real situation is and what's the best way to handle that and I just if I can add congressman that one of the other issues for me is that having worked with these kids for a long time, adoption as we know it as a social practice is not that prevalent in the countries that these kids are coming from, any of them. And so they don't understand adoption as a social construct. Their parents and families and caregivers in their foreign countries don't understand adoption as a social construct. So sometimes it takes a year or two to kind of figure it out. They don't even know what it means. You know, They're just like, oh, they're with these people now. It, you know, some kids describe it to me as being kidnapped because that's how it feels to them, and it's very troubling. Yeah, I, I, I think if um, like kind of educating people overseas about what adoption is and what it means, mm -hmm. and you know how we do it here, and advocating for a foster care system within Ethiopia to raise their own children domestically in other countries and supporting them through that and having it going as a culture, foster the children that are within your country so the kids are not getting adopted, false, false information and fraud and saying that, oh, you're gonna come to America and get education, but you're actually getting a family. That's a huge wave, <laughs> you know? Um, so definitely what Maureen said is very true. Culturally, people are not aware about adoption and it should be. It's not ironic there. that we don't, practice the same social work standards abroad that we do here. <laughs> you know, family preservation, patient <coughs> care when appropriate. And international adoption has been cherry picking kids for years. If you figure that there are 140 million kids at risk, which is the UN's number uh, globally, they're not all orphans. In fact, most of them are. The UN definition is one parent living, which Chariqua had. Yep. Um, but there were 8,000 international adoptions last year. And even if there were 25,000, not exactly a strategic response, really, at all. And then when you factor in that, you know, let's say out of the 8,000 last year, easily 10% of those adoptions have gone south. And so let's talk about what happened to those 800 kids. We're worried about the 300 girls in Nigeria, and rightly so, but we have those kids here, just in a different way. Yeah, definitely, and I would add that, like, within, because I was adopted when I was older, my adoptive parents changed my name, that with the not understand for the life of us why we have a new name and we kept calling each other by our given name and we would get in trouble for this kind of things from our adoptive parents and then we couldn't speak our native language um, 
and that was troubling as well. We, I mean, we had identities. We know where we were. We know that we were Ethiopian by birth, that we're African and stuff like that. We basically built identity by our family, within our community, within our culture, and then coming here and changing our everything. Our adoptive parents couldn't understand or support us through that process, basically. They didn't say, oh my gosh, I understand that now you're here with a stranger in the house and walking around and you don't know what's going on. They didn't understand that they thought we should just come in and just adjust and be happy and stuff like that. We couldn't be because they're stranger to us and we're stranger to them. So, so the first thing she did when she got her own kind of life was? I changed my name. <laughs> <laughs> but she had to go to court to get a real name back. <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with that? Yeah. I moved to Maine and I was 18 and I filed for a name change and it was very easy. I mean, the process of changing it with your health care, social security was kind of overwhelming, but it was all worth it. But that's a, that's a, that's a training issue, sure. you know. Simple. And Tariqa, do, do your, your parents back in Ethiopia, do they, have you had, do you know they have any contact with them? Do they know of your situation, what, what happened after you left uh, Ethiopia? After five years of living in America, um, that's when I was moving to Maine, uh, uh, becoming of age, we'd be in contact by letters and sending um, photos or things like that. Our adoptive mom basically sent them photos and information about us, but made it look like my sisters and I are together and that we wasn't separated, basically. And once I became of age, I called up an Ethiopian friend, and I was like, she's a translator. And I was like, okay, here's what's going on. You need to translate this. So I basically told them that I, I'm safe. They were worried. And I just told them that I was with a new family, and I'm safe, and I've been separated from my sisters. And just basically talking about how my life has been, and what has been going on, basically. And they were happy to hear that. We were fine, but they were horrified about my sisters and I being separated. They're like, this isn't what I signed up for. Why would you separate the siblings who were grew up together and who shared everything of our life in our home, land in our home? So, yeah, they're, they are pretty much aware, and I'm going to go see them a um, couple days now. <laughs> so I'm going to be flying out for the first time well, in eight years to see them. Be a powerful reunion. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, uh, what, what do you think the child welfare agencies need to know in terms of identifying those uh, children that might be uh, most at risk of being rehomed? What do you think would be a, you know, some of the well, I think we probably would both agree. I think there are two, but there will be developmental issues where there's been lengthy institutional trauma, um, kids coming from war torn countries, um, and I think I, I see a huge sector of kids from Rus Russia and Eastern Europe who have prenatal substance exposure that was undiagnosed, especially alcohol exposure. And I think, Congressman, that 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 group of kids from certain countries that have pretty, would you say, darling, pretty consistent profiles yeah. Yeah. that present with behavioral health issues that have potentially very complex neurological disorders, and those families are very challenged. And nevertheless, I would say that of the earnest families, a lot of them are embracing their kids. To, to Darlene's point, they just cannot find competent service providers. And in, in, in New England, we happen to be blessed with a team in Boston that is non-corral. But you know, they can only see so many patients. Right. And I would also talk about what are the reporting mechanisms because if our, if our local child welfare department got, and you can speak to this, got a report from you saying I've been rehomed, I don't know if we are educated, we even know what that means so that we can respond appropriately. Um, it doesn't really fall neatly into the <coughs> Boarding laws, so I think we need to look at that to, to to make sure that there are ways to be able to trigger that type of child welfare intervention, um, so that kids have a safety net. Then some states read it as abandonment, and so they do bring the kids into care. Other states, the kids report very specific abuse and neglect, and so they bring them into care. 
The problem is with a child who doesn't speak English well, who isn't of age, who doesn't have a cell phone, who doesn't go to school, the school is a great boon for a lot of kids. Right. They have no idea of how to self-report. Right. right, we're putting this all on the children right. to be able to explain it in a way that our system responds to it. And that, I think we need to look you know, the other way around. Right. It's all about surveillance. I mean, when we talk about child welfare cases, if a child's over the age of five and attending school and gets regular health care, you know that there are going to be some eyes on that child. But for kids younger than that, or kids that are homeschooled, you really don't get the same um, surveillance. Good point. Um, we have about, um, about uh, 10 more minutes left, and the audience is very patient. Uh, anybody from the audience have any uh, questions that have jumped out? You or suggestions or comments? Hi, uh, my name is Kathy Crow. I just I have a comment, and, and that is that this has been just wonderful, and I want to thank you, Congressman, for your leadership on the issue. We had the pleasure of working together on some other issues in D.C. and the bravery, and uh, I just can't tell you enough how meaningful it is to have you here and how helpful it, it really is to understand the problem. And in that regard, I would say, you know not to just rename or relabel something, but the term rehoming is to me is a shocking um, you know, misnomer. It is not rehoming because it's not a home to begin with. So I think 